class. Um, the 17 periods, I think, uh, of course, that the Waldrons came teaching this uh, really good uh, overview in brief of the entire Bible narrative. And uh, coming out of the United Kingdom into the Divided Kingdom, uh, we're about almost halfway through Divided Kingdom period. And uh, I think some interesting things we'll look at tonight, some of which really relate to the background uh, of this period going forward, the historical and a geopolitical background of this period. We're going to be talking about the Assyrian Empire and its development, its rise to power, its expansion, which really becomes significant in the chapters ahead, but it starts in this period we are right now in the, the reign of uh, around the time of Jehu. Uh, so we'll be looking at the Assyrian Empire, just some history about that tonight, and then uh, we've talked a little bit about what Haziel has done from Syria in cutting off Israel. We've talked about that a little bit already. Uh, Jehoiada enthrones Joash uh, in Judah, and then Athaliah is executed, and th that'll be toward the end of our study tonight. So again, glad that we can be together. Here's this period of the kings. Again, I stole Wayne's chart and uh, threw it up there. So we're looking at Athaliah being queen, the usurper in at the bottom there, and then Joash is going to be uh, coronated in our lesson. Uh, that time period, uh, by the way, it's a little deceiving on the chart because the heads are over here about 800, but really the lines go to here about 850, 840 is the um, time period that we're looking at for, these, for these, this queen and king. All right, so in looking at the Assyrian Empire, um, its capital is Nineveh in ancient times. Uh, famous, comes into a number of Bible stories. We remember it especially uh, because of Jonah's uh, relationship to it, but uh, it, you know it's the capital of Assyria for uh, a good long period of time. Uh, it's a, a strong capital as far as that goes, and is fortified as you go along. The Assyrian Empire, as as clearly seen here, is northeast of Israel. Uh, here, uh, modern Iran. Uh, Later on, the Persians would have this area, and so really I think the Iranians relate more to the Persians. But You can see, even on this map, it's just really big. And the area that we've been looking at, this whole uh, divided kingdom, that's right here. So it's just a really small spot in the Middle Eastern world this time. The, the, what all of our emphasis has been on really just a, a very, sm very small area if you think about it con compared to everything that's going on in the big wide world. And you can just see that even in this map and this would not even expand to other things we might look at. But God, God is uh, going, to, going to use Assyria. They're developing, as I've already said, during this time period into a really mighty and fierce empire that God is going to use as a tool for judgment uh, both on Israel and to some extent on Judah and uh, others as well, as far as that goes. Uh, God does this often in biblical history, and this is a sterling example of Him reigning among the nations, uh, calling, causing uh, certain nations to rise up uh, so that others may be punished or influenced in this way or that. And uh, God is in charge of what goes on among the nations, and this is going to be a great example of that. The big rival during... Uh, most of this Assyrian period is Egypt. I think Assyria would have liked to have conquered Egypt. There are major battles between the two of them uh, as you go down for the next century and a half or so, uh, maybe a little bit longer. But um, that uh, is something that will come into the periphery of the Bible story a couple of times. Um, but Jehu interacted with King Shalmaneser III of Assyria. This is really the first uh, time in the Bible we have Assyria uh, really coming into play in uh, much of the Bible history. So those are some of the significant things about it that we'll be touching on in the next few moments. So as we think about the Assyrian Empire, if you're going through the Bob and Sandra Waldron book, their curriculum, it sort of stops the narrative of history here and talking about the kings and what's going on in Israel and Judah to look at Assyria, and so that's what we're going to do as well. And again, Assyria has been slowly growing, uh, and it's going to become a key actor on the world stage and in the histories of Israel and Judah. 
as I've already said, affecting both of them in pretty big ways. Other ancient kingdoms that we've looked at that Israel has been interacting with and to some degree will continue to act, interact with, like Syria and Moab and Edom and Ammon and Philistia and Phoenicia, all of these are very small kingdoms in, in the big wide world. And so in that map that we showed of the, all of Assyria, again, this is just a small part of the world and all of those kingdoms are relatively small uh, compared to everything else that's, that's going on. Um, it's important that we not confuse Syria and Assyria. I'll try to make sure to say the A before that every time. Much different places, much different people. Uh, the Syrians that uh, Israel and Judah have already had a lot to do with over uh, the centuries now uh, continue that. But Assyria becomes this large power that influences all of these kingdoms. So the geographical power of Assyria had sort of ebbed and flowed, but about the time of Solomon's kingdom, when it divided, uh, that the Assyrian kingdom began to expand and uh, slowly uh, will really gobble up a, a good bit of that part of the world. The Assyrian Empire was known for its, its cruelty and its harshness, as has been said and observed by a lot of historians. A um, number of things could be said here. I was talking with Wayne about it a minute ago, and uh, he was talking about you, you know, the, the Assyrians' approach to uh, dealing with other nations that were kind of gobbling up nations, a bit like Hitler gobbled up Europe. <laughs> but it was like uh, they sent an emissary, and they'd say, you know, you, you want to pay tribute to us and uh, you know, let us take charge here. And if they said no then they would uh, send an army and surround them at, with the army, and they'd say, okay, how about now? And if they said no to that, then the Assyrians would wipe them out. And in wiping them out, I mean, they really wiped them out. What every, every kingdom that we're going to look at, every world kingdom that we're going to look at from now on, from, from the Assyrians, the Babylonians, onto the Medes and the Persians, and the Greeks, these are the four large um, empires that will arise in the next few hundred years in biblical history. But... One observation to make is every one of these empires dealt with its uh, kingdoms that it conquered and the people that it conquered in a different way. Each one of them had a unique way of what do you do with the people you've conquered? How do you deal with those people? And so the Assyrians' approach was, as we'll see when we get to them conquering the northern kingdom, the Assyrians' approach was basically you... Uh, you completely overwhelm the land with military force. Then you take as many people captive as you want to. And you take them to other lands that you've captured. So you just spread them out all over the place. And the purpose of that is, if you take uh, an Israelite, for instance, and you put him over in Babylon or you know Greece somewhere, or whatever it is, you, you take them, they're not going to want to fight for those lands because they're not living in their lands anymore. They're not going to rebel against you when they're living in some foreign country. You know, what, they're not going to get together and band against you and form a revolt. That's never going to happen. So the Assyrians, very wisely, when they captured people, they just scattered them all over the place. What the Babylonians did was different. They, they, they would just wipe nearly everybody out that they conquered, killing most of them. But they would take the very best of those people and bring them to Babylon to use them in the Babylonian kingdom. That's why Daniel goes to Babylon. Uh, with his friends, and probably Ezekiel too, as far as that goes. So again, a whole different approach. When, when the, the, the Persians come, uh, they try to make friends with everybody. They say, okay, we're going to send everybody that's been cap taken captive, we're going to send you back home and be nice to you and let you build your shrines and your temples and all of that. And so the captives get to come home after 70 years, right? But that's how the Persians dealt with their captives. The Greeks had a whole different thing. When they, when they came along, they began to conquer the world. And what they would say is, we're just going to make everybody Greek. We're going to teach them our language. We're going to teach them the love of our culture. We're going to show them our art. And we're just going to make everybody want to be a Greek. And they were pretty successful at that. So each one of these kingdoms had this different approach to how they deal with nations they conquered. Right now we're in Assyria. They're going to be cruel. Uh, they're not somebody to mess with. And if you do, you're probably going to get hurt. So in, in the story that we're in right now in the narrative, Ahab had defeated Ben-Hadad of, of Syria in battle twice. So Syria and Israel are going, to get, going at each other. We've seen that 
repeatedly. Ahab dies when he fights with Ben-Hadad that third time when he allies himself with Jehoshaphat or Jehoshaphat goes along with him. Ahab dies in that uh, third battle. But a few years before Ahab's death, Shalmaneser, the Assyrian king, invades Canaan. At that time, Ahab in Israel and Ben-Hadad in Syria uh, form an alliance to try to withstand the Assyrian onslaught. So here you have two really rival kingdoms, Syria and Israel. They join together to fight their common enemy. Right? So the enemy of my enemy is my friend, that kind of thing. Uh, they join together to fight Assyria, and they're not really wholly successful. Assyria, Assyria is a little bit more than they can handle. Um, and this occurs at the Battle of Karkar in 853 B.C. That's right in the middle of the time period we're looking at in Israel. So Shalmaneser defeats this coalition, uh, but he's not able to enter into Canaan at this time and decisively take it. So we don't have it. Obviously, that doesn't happen in the biblical account. It didn't happen in history. But he's a force to be reckoned with, and that becomes, that becomes clear. So Hazel, when he's king of Syria, uh, he's anointed by Elisha. This is 842, 2 Kings 8. We've looked at that already. Um, and he's going to do a lot of hurt in Israel himself. Uh, but around that time, just after that time, Shalmaneser attacks Syria. This was about the time that we are at in the biblical narrative. This is when Athaliah has just usurped Judah's throne. So she's just killed all of the royal descendants and taken over Judah's throne right about this time. Hazel uh, had to face Assyria alone because Jehu and Israel, who was the king about that time, would not come to his aid this time. So now Hazel has to face Assyria alone. Shalmaneser comes all the way to Damascus, the capital city of Syria, and uh, does everything but take it. So just puts the fear in the Syrian that is not able to take Damascus during that period. So that's, again, we're seeing the rise of Assyria. We're seeing its inroads into the northern fringe of Israel and its uh, bordering countries in Syria. Shalmaneser, in attacking Syria then in 841 B.C., uh, instead of, as we've already said, joining Haziel to fight Shalmaneser, what Jehu does is he submits to the Assyrian king and he pays tribute, which was frankly probably pretty smart. Jehu was very savvy politically, we've already seen that, and a pretty sharp ruler in a lot of ways. He sees there's no sense in me joining uh, with Syria to fight against Assyria, I'll just, I'll just bow the knee and uh, they'll be happy with that and let us alone. And for a while he was right. Um, so that, that's, what, that's what Jehu decides to do and does. Um, Hazel uh, is left to fight alone, as we've already said. So what Shalmaneser does then, during, as, as he makes the conquest of these periods, as many ancient kings would do, when their conquests are completed, they want a history of those. And usually they want to leave their history in stone for propaganda. You know, so they make a history of their great deeds and their conquests, conquests and they want, they want that history to be left in stone. And usually it's very favorable to the king who's making the monument. Uh, this is a monument that's known as the Black Obelisk of Shalmaneser III. It has various um, artistic depictions, reliefs on it, uh, depicting uh, battles that uh, Shalmaneser won and lands that he had taken and conquests of uh, a number of kings. There's a, a number of drawings on it of kings that were submitting to him. And included among those drawings is one of Jehu. Uh, there's a panel that reads the tribute of Jehu, the son of Omri. Foreign kingdoms, we've already noticed this uh, before, but uh, foreign kingdoms saw Israel, their, their lineage of kings, as the house of Omri, although we know that that's not strictly correct, but that's how they referred to it. So uh, Jehu, son of Omri, is the way that Shalmaneser uh, describes the king of Israel. This is a close-up 
of uh, that happening. This, by the way, is in the British Museum. I had a privilege of taking that picture a few years ago. Uh, and it's, the monument's about six feet high, made out of stone. Um, it's, it's really impressive just to look at when you consider how old it is. And so you're looking at something that's, you know, 2,800 years old. Uh, that's telling a story that's pretty interesting. But here is, here is the, at, the, the drawing, the carving, if you will. And what it's showing is this is Jehu or somebody representing Jehu down here. And this is Shalmaneser or somebody representing him. Now, did they actually look like that? I don't know if the person who, who did this uh, you know, carving was uh, actually saw Jehu or not. But it's kind of interesting to speculate that that this is, according to most scholars, this would be recognized as the earliest image of a single Israelite that we have from ancient times. Again, about 840-ish B.C. So it gets to be Jehu, who we've studied and is renowned. But that's an interesting uh, picture that we have of some of the events surrounding the Bible story at this time. Do I have questions or thoughts about any of that? Anybody? I hope you find it a little bit interesting at least uh, as we're, we're going forward. It'll help you understand uh, what Assyria is and what both Israel and Judah are dealing with when they now have to begin to deal with Assyria in the chapters to come. Um, all right. So we're going to go now to the text of Scripture, which is where we want to be anyway, in Second Chronicles chapter 23. Just a reminder, and maybe if you weren't in the class last time, again, what has happened is Athaliah, her son, has uh, been slain, is no longer king of Judah. She decides she's going to be the queen. She wipes out all of the royal heirs, uh, her grandchildren, essentially. Uh, everybody she can get her hands on except for one. And uh, this one is saved by Jehoshabeth, the daughter of the king, the wife of the priest. Uh, Jehoiada, and Jehoiada is going to, and, Jeho, and, and um, Jehoshabeth are going to preserve uh, Joash and keep him safe from Athaliah's murderous campaign until he can be crowned queen. And that's what we're going to be seeing. He can be crowned king. <laughs> and that's what we're going to be seeing in the next few minutes. So let's pick up the story uh, in Second Chronicles. The time had really come to bring Judah's rightful king out of hiding. Uh, again, Jehoiada uh, had been hiding Joash for several years in the area of the temple, uh, preparing for this moment, knowing that Athaliah could not sit on the throne of Judah. It was not God's will. It was not right. She was not good for Judah. She was an evil person in every way, as we've seen. And uh, she needed to be uh, taken out. And he was uh, the person to do it. I think God using him for that purpose. So the text begins in 2 Chronicles chapter 23 and verse 1. In the seventh year, that's the seventh year of Athaliah's reign, uh, seventh year of hiding Joash. In the seventh year, Jehoiada strengthened himself and made a covenant with the captains of hundreds, uh, Azariah, the son of Jehoram, uh, Ishmael, the son of Jehonadab, Azariah, the son of Obed, Messiah, the son of Adiah, and Elishaphat, the son of Zikri. So he's, he's made a, a, a covenant, an agreement, gotten the ear of and got the uh, allegiance of some of the key military leaders in Israel. And they're named here. And then uh, they went throughout the land in verse 2. They went throughout Judah and gathered the Levites from all the cities of Judah, the chief fathers of Israel, and they came to Jerusalem. A couple of things to notice here. And Jehoiada is strengthening himself. He knows what he needs to do. Uh, he, he needs to get the rightful king anointed as king and accepted by the people, enthroned. He needs to do that. He needs to have a good military bank, backing, backing from the people, and especially a backing of the religious and spiritual leaders, which, of which he was the chief since he was the high priest. So he needs all of that in order for this to work. He doesn't go off just with half, you know, I got a good idea and I'm just going to go off and do this. But there's a lot of planning, thought, no doubt prayer, 
uh, wisdom of God you see at work here. And so he's going to arrange everything uh, with a lot of forethought to, to bring uh, Joash to the throne. He strengthens himself. And I don't, I don't think it, it doesn't mean he's lifting weights, right? <laughs> he strengthens himself uh, politically uh, with his alliances uh, with the, both the Levites and the military uh, force. So he's strengthening himself, making sure everybody's together here, and apparently a large part of the people as well, who are probably sick and tired of Athaliah if they had anything to him at all. Uh, so that's, that's what's happening. Um, we come then uh, to, to see what exactly that uh, Jehoiada accomplishes. First of all, he establishes an armed protective detail around uh, Joash, uh, who needs just a child still, seven years old or so, needs to be protected. He gathers the nation's leadership to solicit their, their support. You see that in verse 2 that I just read. And then everybody is committed. Uh, he gets everybody on board to what God has spoken, to what we're trying to accomplish here. Uh, chapter 23 and verse 3 of Second Chronicles. Then all the assembly made a covenant with the king in the house of God. All the assembly, that's all of the people, all of these military, all the Levites, all of them. And he said to them, Behold, the king's son shall reign as the Lord has said of the sons of David. Now that goes all the way back to the promise that God made to David in 2 Samuel 7. Uh, when, we, when our prayers and our actions and our purposes align with the promises of God, we are on super good footing. God will advance our cause. And Jehoiada is uh, advancing this to the people and they're agreeing that they're going to do what God has ordained in getting a, a, a son of David on the throne as was promised by God to David. Uh, of course, that, again, that goes back to 2 Samuel 7. So he, in, in verses 4 and 5, he instructs... Um, the people and his forces as to how they're to deal with all of this. He divides the guards into companies to keep watch. Verse 4, this is what you shall do. One third of you entering on the Sabbath of the priests and the Levites shall be keeping watch over the doors. One third shall be at the king's house uh, and one third at the gate at the foundation. All the people shall be in the courts of the house of the Lord. So everybody's got their place to be divided up. Uh, to protect the temple, to protect uh, Joash, the, the child king, uh, to be. And then in verse 6, he says, Let no one come into the house of the Lord except the priests and those of the Levites who serve. They may, they may, uh, they may go in, for they are holy, but all the people shall keep the watch of the Lord. So there's a distinct, distinguishing between the holy people who could actually go into the temple and those who must stay in the courts. Uh, it's interesting to me, Joy is the high priest. Of course, he'd be really aware, well aware of all of this. Some of the people may not be because of all that had been going on, probably pollution of the temple and everything else during some of this time period. Uh, in any case, Jehoiada is clear. We're, we're not going to profane the temple. We're not going to profane the temple. We're not going to do war in the temple. Okay? That's not, we're going to keep the temple holy. The people who are in it are going to be holy. Everybody else who's involved in this is going to be outside the confines of the temple. And this goes back, of course, way back to uh, when God instituted the tabernacle on which the temple was sort of patterned, uh, that the children of Israel shouldn't come into it. Uh, we're to stay out, outside. Uh, and it was only, only the Levites and the priests that were to go into the inner courts. Jehoiada is respecting the law of God and the will of God in all of this, um, really Im immensely so. What goes next is uh, he surrounds uh, young Joash with um, a good bit of protection. Let's read this in verse 7. The Levites shall surround the king on all sides. The king, that is the king to come, the seven-year-old, uh, Joash. Surround him on all sides, every man with his weapons in his hand. Whoever comes into the house, let him be put to death. You are to be with the king when he comes in and when he goes out. So protection 
protection detail for the king at all times. So the Levites and all Judah did according to all that Jehoiada the priest had commanded. And each of them, each man took his men who were to be on duty on the Sabbath with those who were going off duty on the Sabbath. For Jehoiada the priest had not dismissed the divisions. And so everybody's all hands on deck is what that's saying. Uh, and Jehoiada the priest gave to the captains of hundreds the spears and the large and small shields which had belonged to King David that were in the temple of God. Now, there is poetic justice. There is, you know, the way things ought to be. Here, these men are defending the heir of David, the heir to the throne, with the weapons that David left here. The spears and the shields. These are the weapons that these men are carrying. The, the very weapons of David. And so, this, this, is, this is just a, a sort of a beautiful wonderfully timed in the providence of God event that is occurring as Jehoiada, uh, no doubt following uh, what he believed to, to be, and I think certainly was, the will of God during this time period. We come down then to verse 11. And they brought out the king's son, and they put the crown on him. And they gave him the testimony and made him king. Then Jehoiada and his sons anointed him and said, Long live the king. So the king is crowned. The king is given the testimony. And if I understand the reference there, and I believe we can understand it from Scripture, if you look way back in, in Exodus, uh, the, the commandments that were, Ten Commandments that were put in the ark are called the testimony. So the, the testimony there is, the, is the, the law of God written. The testimony the law of, of the law of Moses, Exodus 25, 16, is, is a reference there. And that law was, according to what Moses told the people in Deuteronomy, when they had a king over there, remember Deut Deuteronomy um, chapter 17, and later on even, there Moses, in talking to the children of Israel, before they enter the land, he tells them, you're going to have a king. Well, they weren't even a nation really yet. They didn't have a territory yet, but he says, you're going to have a king. And when you have a king, you're supposed to give him the law, and he's supposed to keep the law with him, and he's supposed to read it. So receiving the law of God was symbolic of being the king. That's what the king was supposed to do. He was supposed to be given by the priests the law of God to keep with him and read. So being given the testimony here is at least a, a really symbolic act and may, may have been something that was supposed to be, have been done with every coronation. I'm not sure. Uh, but it seems like Moses is saying something like that. When in Deuteronomy 17, he says this in verse 18 of Deuteronomy 17, it shall be, talking about the king, it shall be when he sits on the throne of his kingdom that he shall write for himself a copy of this law in a book from the one before the priests and the Levites. So he's supposed to have a copy of the law and it shall be with him. He shall read it all the days of his life that he may learn to fear the Lord his God and be careful to observe all the words of this law and these statutes. Now that was not done for probably most of the kings. But here it appears that it's being done, that the law is given to the king. Uh, which, again, impressive on Jehoiada's part, for sure, the way he's approaching this. And they shout out, as they do in all the movies, you know, all the movies when anybody's crowned king, long live the king, right? I think they did that when King Charles was crowned not long ago in England. Long live the king. Uh, Athaliah, the evil queen, hears all of this going on. <clears throat> and in verse 12, um, when Athaliah heard the noise of the people running and praising the king, she came to the people in the temple of the Lord. She looked, and there was the king standing by his pillar at the entrance. And the leaders and the trumpeters were by the king, and all the people of the land were rejoicing and blowing trumpets, also the singers with musical instruments, and those who led in praise. So Athaliah tore her clothes, no doubt in grief and rage, and shouts, treason, treason. Now that's what you call ironic. I mean, here, the most treasonous person, or one of them, probably in the whole history of Israel, murdering her own grandchildren to get the throne, uh, <laughs> shouting treason when they're crowning the proper and rightful king. Uh, but that's the way she looked at the world. You know, some people have a weird way of looking at the world, don't they? 
<laughs> and it seems to revolve all around, all around them. We seem to have a lot of those in the world today, just the world revolves around me and here's how I look at it. Uh, but that was Athaliah for sure. Uh, and, and her perception of this is just, that in itself is breathtaking. But Jehoiada uh, orders her execution uh, in verse 14, <clears throat> Jehoiada the priest brought out the captains of hundreds who were set over the army. These are the ones he'd made alliances with already, and so he's prepared for all of this. Take her outside under guard, slay her with the sword, whoever follows her, with the sword, whoever follows her, so not only her, but also her immediate followers. Uh, for the priest had said, do not kill her in the house of the Lord. There was not going to be bloodshed in God's house. So they seized her. Uh, she went by the way of the entrance of the, uh, to the horse gate, should be where the horses came in and out of this area, into the king's house, and they killed her there. So just exactly according to the plan uh, of Jehoiada in removing her and setting up Joash as king. I want to think for just a few minutes about at least one, there might be several, overall lessons that we can learn from this pretty uh, fascinating account in my mind. Um, this, this instance of Jehoiada anointing Joash and elevating him to the throne, uh, as I, we've hinted out already, it really required a lot of wisdom and courage on Jehoiada's part. It's one thing to be courageous and, and want to do God's will and be courageous in, in attempting that. It's something else to have wisdom and understand how to go about accomplishing things. Uh, wisdom and courage don't always meet in people. We sometimes have courageous people who don't have a lot of wisdom, and sometimes we have wise people who don't have a lot of courage. We need people with courage and wisdom. And you really see that in Jehoiada uh, on, on, I think, full display. Uh, the Lord says to us through Paul in 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 13 that we are to watch, we are to stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. The old King James Version says, quit ye like men, you know, stand like men and fight. We need, we need people of courage in the Lord's church. Uh, but we, we have to have the moral and spiritual resolve coupled with you know wisdom is understanding the risks that are involved and what the risks are and what we can do to either eliminate or reduce risk uh, going forward you, you don't just you don't have to paul you know the apostle paul never threw himself in the fire right he never said yeah just go ahead and take me to the lions he resisted that there was a lot of wisdom in the way paul dealt with he's a very courageous person proclaiming God's Word, doing God's work. But a lot of wisdom in the way he went forward uh, in, in dealing with all of that. And, and so it is with us. We, we have to have this moral and spiritual resolve, but also an understanding of the risks that are involved and a wise plan of action, and ultimately complete trust in God. There are a couple of examples that just jump out at me, uh, and I think others who've taught this, particularly Esther. I thought of her immediately. Um, here she is. We go back or forward, I guess it would be, to the book of Esther. Um, her people are about to be slaughtered by the evil plots of Haman. You remember the story? Uh, she's made aware uh, by Mordecai, her kinsman, as to what's about to happen. Um, it's, it's a horrible time for Jews uh, in, the, in, the, in the land of captivity. And I want to go back, uh, or forward again, I should say, and look at these verses in Esther, which I think are pretty familiar to us. Um, Esther chapter 4. Mordecai is trying to encourage her to do what she needs to do to appeal to the king on behalf of the people and get this murderous plot stopped. And he tells her in chapter 4 and verse 13 through messengers, 
Do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all of the Jews. If you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews, but from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you've come to the kingdom for such a time as this. So, you know, Esther didn't plan to be put in the middle of all of this danger and uh, try to be the one to solve this huge problem. But her response in verse 16 is, Go gather all the Jews who are present in Shushan. Fast for me, neither eat nor drink for three days, night or day. My maids and I will fast likewise, and so I will go to the king, which is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. But she has a plan going forward. As she goes into the king, she's received by him. She has a plan going forward to how to expose Haman, and she does that very wisely, just not all at once, but by a series of banquets, as you remember, and all of that. So here's, here's a, a woman with extreme courage, not just rushing headlong into something, but the thing that she does most of all, although God's name is not mentioned in the book of Esther, what's plain is the thing she does most of all is trust God. The fasting, uh, and all of that that goes on before even she makes this attempt, she trusts God. So all of that, all of that comes together in her story. I think it comes together pretty well in Jehoiada's story. And if you go forward in the book of Acts, uh, Peter and John, same sort of thing. The, the wisdom, the courage, uh, the thoughtfulness that they went forward. They're not just recklessly risking their lives. God doesn't ask us to recklessly risk our lives. Our lives are at risk all of the time. But we need to use wisdom to do His work, get it done in the best way possible, possible without harm, if possible. At least, not, at least without harm to good people, if possible. So all of that takes a lot of forethought. I mean, I need to stop there. Anybody else have a thought or question, comment? Anybody at all? Why do you think God's providence has brought out the last I'm I'm not sure. It's that's an interesting age. We have a couple of others that are brought out seven, eight years old. Uh, that's a for us. That's still a, just a child, not capable of doing a whole lot. Uh, they can communicate, and you can communicate to them very well at that age. Yeah, yeah. You're, you're usually a, all human beings tend to be pretty good readers by that time if they're taught. Uh, we can we can read by then. That's a good point too. Yeah. Anything else, Wayne? Oh yeah. So Wayne is mentioning, you know, Jehoiada, I, I think there's no doubt, he knew God's promise to David all along. And even when Athaliah starts her killing spree, uh, Jehoshabeth recognizes, and Jehoiada, I think, both must recognize, an heir to the throne has got to be saved of the line of David. And, and that's the time, as Wayne's saying, you've you got to step up and do what needs doing. And, uh, and rescuing Joash at that time was, was critical, and of course they did that. All right, we need to stop. Appreciate uh, y'all's good attention tonight. Thank you. Good evening. This past week, I was honored to study the last two chapters of the book of Ezra with the young people. And to you, this may be a bit of a repeat, but I continue to think on many of the lessons in this book as, as the week built up to Sunday night and since then. The book of Ezra is a pretty remarkable book. It's got some extremely unique characteristics. For one, it paints a positive view of a king of a pagan nation. You've got Cyrus, king of Persia. And it opens up, and he opens up. A king of a, patient, of a pagan nation would say, all the kingdoms the Lord God of Israel has given me. Most pagan kings would never give God glory. Then he goes on in that same first verse of the book to say, that God commanded me to build him a house. And if you go back to Isaiah, God did say that he would build him a house. And if you think about it, it's also very, very rare in the Old Testament for God to paint a positive picture of the Israelites. But as you think through the book of Ezra, God paints a pretty positive view of the Israelites. In chapter 3, they begin to restore worship. Chapter 3 and verse 1, 
In the seventh month had come, the children of Israel were in the cities. The people gathered together as one man to Jerusalem. All came out to the assembly, gathered together as one man. In verse 4, they kept the Feast of Tabernacles, as it was written in the, the daily burnt offerings, in the numbers required by the ordinances for each day. We see a picture of people that are there. We're serving God like they haven't served God in many, many, many years. Even after a setback, they began to build the temple and they were, they were, they faced obstacles. Let us help you. No, only the Israelites will build. Even after facing obstacles in a setback, in the face of adversity, Ezra chapter 5 and verse 2, so Zerubbabel, the son of Sheliot, and Jeshua, the son of Zodak, rose up and began to build the house which is in Jerusalem, and the prophets of God were with him, helping him. So they continued to build even in the conflict. They kept the Passover. And we could look at many other things. But tonight, as we're focused at this time on those that may be considering the question of obeying gospel, or making uh, sin right with God. There's also some very helpful thoughts in this book as well. If you're trying to say, is this word that we're reading worth believing, this book opens with some really nice evidence that Scripture is true, Scripture is, um, can be trusted. We have Ezra, oh, Cyrus, being spoke of here at the very beginning. And if you go back over 200 years to Isaiah chapter 44, maybe to Jeremiah, but also we'll, we'll look at Isaiah 44 and verse 28. When Isaiah says, 200 years before this is happening, who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd. He shall perform all my pleasure, says, saying to Jerusalem, you shall be built and to the temple your foundation shall be laid. And then it goes on in the chapter 45 to continue that conversation. And then 200 years later in Ezra 1.1, we read Ezra say that the Lord God of heaven told me to build, build him a house. At the time that that was said, Persia, Assyria was in power. Babylon hadn't even come to be yet in Persia. Not a blip on the map not to be thought of. There's also something in here for each of us, whether we're setting out to obey the gospel or not, a mindset to mimic. In Ezra chapter 9 and verse 4, it reads, Then everyone who trembled at the words of God of Israel assembled to me because of the transgression of those who had been carried away captive. And I sat astonished until the evening sacrifices. Everyone who trembled at the words of the Lord. Here's a people who have gotten taken to captivity because of the way they treated the words of the Lord. And now they're, they're described as people who tremble at the words of the Lord. In chapter 10 and verse 3, that phrase is repeated. They trembled at the commandments of God. So here is a people who have gone from getting cast out of their place to trembling at the commandments. And if they, were to, if they were to be trembling at the commandments of the Lord, and they was to read the words of Exodus chapter 34 and verse 16, you take the daughters of your sons and his daughters to play the harlot with their God and make your sons play the harlot with their gods. And the many other passages that warn the children of Israel to be separate, to not intermarry with the people. If you was to read a passage like that and you trembled at the words of God and you realized that you were married and there was many among you who had married, to pagan women in the land. You wouldn't know what to do. What was their reaction? They confessed and they showed great remorse. In chapter 9, the first three verses, when these things were done, the leaders came to me saying, the people of Israel, the priests, the Levites, have not separated themselves from the people of the land with respect to the abomination of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Egyptians, and the Amorites. For they have taken some of their daughters as wives for themselves and their sons so that the holy seed is mixed with the people of those lands. Indeed, the hands of the leaders and the rulers were foremost in this trespass. Even you see that the leaders were taking and leading the way in this sin. And then it says, So when I heard these things, I tore my garments and my robe, and I plucked out some of the hair of my head and my beard, and I sat down astonished. 
You know, even in the divided kingdom, we saw kings who would be remorseful. And again, in chapter 9 and verse 6, Oh my God, I'm too ashamed and humiliated to lift up my face to you. My God, for our iniquities have risen higher than our head and our own guilt up to the heaven. But by the time you get to chapter 10 and verse 1, the people are remorseful as well. Now while Ezra was praying and while confessing and weeping and bowing down before the house of God, a very large assembly of men and women and children gathered to him from Israel, and the people wept bitterly. What a great picture of God's people. We have sinned. What should we do? You see great remorse. You see great sorrow. But one of the questions that we ask Sunday night, does it end there? What's missing from this picture? And we talked about that repentance was missing from this picture. Great godly sorrow is great, but what if they didn't change? What if they felt really bad that they had married the foreign women, but did not change? In Ezra chapter 10 and verse 5, Ezra rose and made the leaders and the priests and the Levites and all Israel swear an oath that they would do according to this word. That two-letter word, do, used several times in this great book, so they swore on an oath. Think about how hard that was to keep. These men to turn their backs on the wives that they had married, the children that they had been born to them through these wives. Why? They trembled at the word of the Lord. Do you tremble at the word of the Lord? Do you tremble at the commandments of the Lord? Do I tremble at the commandments of the Lord? Today, what is God calling on you to do? Is there anything you need to confess? Is there anything that you might need to take beyond just feeling sorry about and repent of? Or do you need to initially obey Him? Are you ready to commit? Think about the commitment that this took of these people to do this really hard task of putting away their wives, putting away their children. They did it. We can. And probably what we might need to get rid of in our life is a much smaller cost. They are examples to us today. But if you're not ready to commit, don't pretend. God has never appreciated in the Old Testament or the New, and it's full of people who identified as God's people, but yet were pretending. If you're not ready to commit, don't pretend. However, if you're ready to permit, we stand ready to assist you. But more importantly, God stands ready to forgive you. If we can help you in any way, please come as we stand and sing.